Do you want to learn how to deal with any objection that could be possibly thrown at you in sales? Then this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Jared Glantz. He is a true sales expert. He's a true sales practitioner as well. He literally leads a team of salespeople who are doing what we're talking about today, which is both cold calling and dealing with objections. You can find out more about Jared and everything he's doing over at CardoneUniversity.com. Everything else that we talk about is linked to in the show notes of this episode over at SalesManPodcast.com. And with all that said, let's jump straight in. Jared, welcome to the Sales and Podcast. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome, sir. I'm glad to have you on. We're going to talk about handling objections today, but just to frame up the conversation before we get to all the, the juicy kind of tactical side of things. And you might have some data, or it might be anecdotal, but what percent, um, percentage might be too accurate, but what percentage of salespeople that you deal with, interact with, and help train are good at handling objections versus just completely suck at it? Yeah, I think that it depends on the stage of the deal that you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about at the very beginning of the deal, if you're making a B2B cold call, um, I think that probably 90% of salespeople suck at it. If you're talking about uh, further along into the process, when you're actually maybe negotiating a deal, you're kind of getting towards the end of the deal. I think that that actually improves um, because people are more settled into the call. So, you know, it probably goes from 90% suck at it on the cold call, uh, all the way up to, you know, maybe 50% are good at it when it actually, uh, comes time to close the deal up. So, so you've teed this up perfectly. You've took the next question essentially out of my mouth here, Jared, of how much of this is tactically. I know when someone says X, I say Y versus how much of it is down to things like confidence is down to you know experience and gut feeling and knowing how to react to these things. Yeah, well, so again, um, you know, we make cold calls in, out of our office every day. We've got, you know, we sell a platform called Cardone University. It's a it's a sales training program that we sell to companies that have sales teams so that they can increase their their production. Right? We are calling cold in most cases, uh, business owners, executives, big companies, small companies. Uh, long sales cycles, short sales cycles. We're, we're calling everybody. In, in, and um, we spend the majority of our time with our team role playing all of all skill levels, experienced team, uh, rookie sales team. We spend the majority of our time role playing the objections that you get in the, in the first bit of the call. So in the very beginning of the call. The reason I think that that's so important is because um, a, a lot of things are coming together in a very short period of time. So when you say, is it about confidence? 100%. Is it about uh, training? 100%. Is it about the amount of repetition that you've had actually going through and role playing and drilling? 100%. Um, it's, it's, it's more of a, it becomes more of a refined skill and an instinct at the beginning of the call. Whereas kind of towards the end of the call, uh, it can be telegraphed you're comfortable, you know, you're in most cases 30 minutes into a conversation. So the, the stakes are much, much lower. So, you know, I think I would rather have a salesperson that could get in the door uh, on the front end and create an opportunity in the first place than somebody who sucks on the front side of it, but, uh, you know, is, is average at the end. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And is role playing, I think you just alluded to it here, but is role playing the best way to deal with this? Because this is something that, uh, most people hate doing, especially if it's with a manager versus, you know, it's a training partner or it's a, it's framed differently. But I know I used to hate looking like a dickhead in front of my manager and him just grilling the heck out of me. Is is that the best way to go about this? Is that the kind of like biggest leverage point that we've got? It's not the best way. It's the only way. It's the only way you're going to get good at handling objections. Like role play and drilling is hands down. It's like, I, I, I use this analogy a lot. Like if you... If you look at the best footballer or the best uh, hockey player or basketball player, or if you look at the best golfer, if you look at the top athletes, the people making all the money, like the big money, you're like, man, I want to be like that. I want to be like LeBron. I want to get LeBron paychecks. You know how much work LeBron puts in before he even gets on the court? Like it, it, I read this, this article about Michael Jordan and he said, dude, I trained so hard that the games were easy. Like the game was the easy part for me. Training was the hard part. 
And, and so in business, like I've got no shot at being LeBron James or uh, Jordan Spieth or a Rory McIlroy or whoever, you know, I have no chance at being that level of a professional athlete. I can make a shitload of money as a salesperson. So if I want to be paid like a professional salesperson, then my training needs to reflect that. And I rarely come across sales organizations that effectively role play and train. And, and it's because salespeople don't like doing it, you know, and, and believe me, if everybody doesn't like doing something, there's money to be made there. If it's something that everybody's pushing away from, there's a massive opportunity in there waiting to be capitalized on. And so role play is a mandatory part of our daily training activity in our office. It, it, it gets the word, it, it, it it's about the repetition, you know, the, the, it, a handful of people have written about the 10,000 hour uh, rule. You know, it's a, you do something for 10,000 hours, you master it. In my mind, when you become a master, that's when you make money as a salesperson. You become a master salesperson. You know, most people don't practice 10 hours in a year uh, in role play. They do it maybe once a, a month for 30 minutes with their manager at their review or once a court, you know, it's just not something that's a part. So I think it's a mindset switch. And today you got to be better than ever. Like you don't have the luxury of uh, uh, that, that you did in years past, right? Now the consumer is much more educated. Now the resources that they have available to them are far more expansive and far greater. The the salesperson, the amateur salesperson, is becoming less valuable. The salesperson that cannot produce, that cannot cold call, that cannot fill a pipeline, that cannot cold. Uh, that cannot close deals, that cannot follow up. The amateur salesperson that cannot do those things is becoming obsolete. They and they will go away. The only people that will be left remaining in digital age, where uh, larger and larger transactions are being taken are taking place without a salesperson involved. The the the, the whole deal is changing. The only person left standing at the end of the game is the pro. You know, as the pie gets smaller. Who gets fed? The hungriest, the fastest, the most skilled. So training, uh, role playing isn't the best way. It's the only way if you want to make big money. How does this look? Well, and we'll dive into uh, strategy and some mindset stuff in a second. But how does this look day to day? You know, even for your team, is this something that we time block off from nine till ten every morning? We we rock and roll through this before we pick up the phone, as in almost a warm up for the real game. Is that how we should be doing this? Yeah. So basically, what we do is our our office day, our office hours are nine to six, right? That's like our our office hours. So at eight thirty, all the salespeople show up for the sales meeting, the morning sales meeting. Prior to eight thirty, they are all required to have viewed six segments of training, six lessons of training from Cardone University or uh, one of our, uh, you know, we have a sales, we, we work for a sales trainer, right? So so all of the training we do comes from Grant. So they're going through uh, books, uh, closing programs, uh, prospecting programs, follow-up programs, sales process, fact-finding programs. They're, they're consuming our own content, but they're doing that prior. They're completing a, a, a mandated training prior to showing up at 8.30 a.m. From 8.30 a.m. until uh, like 8.00, 40, uh, we do a quick meeting and discuss the training. From 8.40 to 9 o'clock, we break off and we do role play. So it is like the, the warm-up shots uh, before you go into the game. Again, go back to a professional athlete. If you want to be a professional salesperson, athletes are a great reference point. It, it makes sense to me that, and this is how I reframed this when I was in medical device sales, the way it was put to me was why would you in the opportunities where you've got to make money, why would you be making your mistakes? That should be where your A game is. And that's when I changed my framing of this and I never had to cold call. And I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could sit in an office and do it all day. Um, the medical device role I had was, you know, going out into the field, speaking with surgeons and because of the products I sold, being kind of welcomed in with open arms, but it'd still be the same thing. I would still practice role play uh, kind of later on when I realized the, the benefits of all this, but I'd do that before I got to them. And I wouldn't be wasting my time, their time, and then the potential, you know, the business's revenue because I'm not, I'm not playing the game the, the way it should be done because I'm screwing up when I'm in front of the customers. It just seems like a no-brainer, right? 
Yeah, well, we, we just call that practicing on customers, you know. So so when we talk to clients and we're presenting our, our program to them, you know, we ask them about their current training processes. We ask them about role play. And the majority of the time, they say that the role play is not taking place. And it, if it does, it's a half-assed thing that they do begrudgingly because they're forced into doing it. And, you know, I, I could go into a whole tangent about leadership and, and, and what kind of the role that leadership has in creating that environment and that culture. But, um, do you just, you, you have to make the time to do it. It's, it's the only way. And, and some people are in a sales environment or they're in an industry or a product where, uh, where, where that is not as important. You know, if like, um, if I work in advertising sales and I'm working a, um, a set territory and I've got set clients who are, I'm basically just showing up and taking an order for, you know, Hey, what do you, you know, I would say that role playing and drilling becomes a little less important, but like you have to understand that those roles are going to be capped. Like, like the people that want to make big money, like the well-rounded salespeople, there are plenty of salespeople who are good salespeople that would be horrible at cold calling. But the most, when you can, when you can get around, like, I want that, that target is a customer. I want to go after that whale and you can pick up the phone and you can see the deal from beginning to end. It's the most empowering. Uh, it's the most financially rewarding and it's the, 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 the biggest, uh, it, it's, it, it, it calls you what you are. It, it gives you the power to be a true salesperson who can create opportunities out of nothing. And that to a sales organization is the most valuable person because you're not reliant on marketing dollars. You're not relying on work and, and expense and energy and effort that the company puts in. You become uh, like what we, we try to tell people, salespeople is, 90% of salespeople are dependent on the company that they work for, for leads, for opportunities, for brand, for name, for recognition, for everything. Okay. There's a small percentage that are, that operate independent of the company. They are the top producers. They are the outliers. They are the ones who create their financial path. They are the ones that companies throw money at to try to keep them with the company. They are, they are the, the elite. They're the ones when they walk in the office, everybody's like, oh, there goes Jared. He is a killer, right? Because they write their own check and they can write their own rule book. I got a guy here. His name is Mike Bonnet. Uh, he's written probably $3 million this year. We're, we're, uh, we're in August, right? He, he's, he's already hit his annual quota in August. He's a monster, right? He's a complete, when, it, when people walk in, we go, hey, there goes Mike Bonnet. <laughs> Right. And, and, uh, he's, he's probably the best person on a cold call that I've ever met in my life. Um, and he gets, you know, handsomely paid for that. You know, he, there's a good chance he'll make, you know, eight or 900 grand this year. So again, you know, if, if you don't want to make money, if you don't want to make big money, if you want to stay in the middle, if you want to stay kind of under the radar, you know, most of the time, those are the people that are saying, Hey, you know, the role play, it's just not my thing. I want to I want to ask you something here, Jared, and you've you've teed it up, and uh, I wasn't planning on talking about it, but I think it's useful here because you're going to give a different opinion than 99% of the other guests that come on the podcast. How does cold calling fit into all of this? You know, looking forward, like two, three, four, five years, is this the skill that we should? Because clearly, we want these 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 high paying roles where we we we've got essentially leverage in the position that we can walk away and take a load of business with us because they can't generate it without us personally. Is cold calling a skill that we should be really doubling down on right now in 2017? Or are there other things that we should be thinking about as well? I think kind of what you're alluding to is, hey, is, is sales changing to the point where, you know, the cold call is becoming less valuable because uh, of demand generation and inbound leads and, and, and content marketing and, and all that stuff. And, and that's fine. But you become a, an effect of something else rather than the cause of it. So, dude, can we put content out every day that drives somebody to a lead page to download an ebook and then we can call somebody up a, a warm lead uh, and, and call somebody up and see if there's an opportunity there? Totally. 
But when I have a salesperson that can walk in and go, I want to take down Sprint Wireless or Ashley Furniture or whoever, and they can go out and they can pick up the phone and make that happen. I got Steve Spray right now. He's like, I'm going to take down Ashley Furniture, which is in, in, the, in the States. It's a, I'm sure they have them there too. They're massive furniture company, largest furniture company uh, uh, in, in, in the country. And dude, he picked up the phone and he's, take, he's picking them off. He's picking all the people off as he goes. Because he's like, I'm a sniper. I can go in early. I can take out the key targets and I can allow the team to advance. So will the cold, is it, is it the skill you should be doubling down on? Of course, 100%. Because those are the most skilled people. Those will be the, 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 the Navy SEALs of your sales team. And then when you as a company want to say, hey, we need to, we need to penetrate this industry. See, like, you, you know, there's two cycles that we talk about. We talk about the business cycle and then we talk about the sales cycle. There's, there's two separate cycles. So uh, we operate as salespeople in the sales cycle. The company operates in the business cycle. Their job is to spend money to market and promote, grab attention and create traffic that leads into the sales process. Salespeople get hung up in the sales process. If you work for a big company, you are a function of the business cycle. You are waiting for the billion dollar company who went out and did a $200 million raise from a venture capital company that has money to spend. You are an, a, an effect of, of that system, that ecosystem. For most entrepreneurs, small business owners, people uh, that are operating in a company right now that they feel doesn't provide them with adequate opportunities, they operate in this business or in this sales cycle, right? Like they are transactional. They don't have the ability to go out and spend the money. So as a salesperson, if you want to create more opportunity rather than being the effect of an opportunity given to you, you must, you must learn to cold call because it's the only way that you can do it. We'll have you back on the future, Jared, because clearly there's, there's programs which you can promote on this as well on the back of an interview, and we'll dive into cold calling into, in, in more detail. Perhaps you can get a couple of people with different opinions on this as well, because clearly it's a hot topic. Probably 50% because people don't like doing it, so they're trying to avoid doing it, essentially. That's why people are talking about personal branding and, and content marketing and things like this. But then the other percent of if it works, then who are you to kind of compete with the market or or tell them how things should be done? So I'm I'm up for a discussion on that. But bringing it back to objections for a second, we get them on the phone, and perhaps cold calling skills comes into this. Is to to use your language here, is the goal to snipe down these objections and just break through them and just they're almost insignificant. They don't matter to us. The goal is to get the conversation the conversation progressed, or are we? strategic are we tactical are we are we listening to the conversations and uh, the the objections and absorbing them and pondering on them and giving them back to them are we going snipe or are we going kind of lovey-dovey with this no so and just to clarify one thing i think that handling objections is 90 percent of cold calling so so the, those conversations come together really really quick um but on on a cold call you're, you're, you are uh, uh, going in as a targeted assassin. You're walking into a, a narrow alleyway with c corners and curves and, and potential uh, bogeys or, uh, you know, uh, enemy fighters around every corner. And the only way that you win is to be prepared. So, like, you know, the, the only way that that skill gets developed is through role play, training, education, repetition. And, and so like in a cold call, for example, I mean, really when, when you talk about objections, period, it's like there's real objections, true real objections, true obstacles to getting the deal done. There's fake objections, which are uh, uh, fabrications, um, uh, made up reaction responses, uh, and then there's the, the deep rooted unspoken objection that most salespeople never get down to. And so on a cold call, the objection handling process is typically dealing with a fake objection, uh, a reactionary defense response. I'm not interested. We're just looking. We're good. Don't have the time for this. It's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a preset, uh, automaticity that people have in their communication path. 
when they get something unexpected put in front of them. The amateur salesperson gives up, right? Because they're not prepared. Because if, if, if I got a group of 100 people and I said, who likes, who likes making cold calls and, and handling objections? You know, five of them raise their hand, right? Maybe three, I don't know. But if I said, if I could show you a way where you could handle any objection with any customer, any industry, any position, any title, any day, any time, I could show you a way that I could guarantee I could do that. Would you like making cold calls? Would you like going into closing situations? How excited would you be to get some objections? If you knew you could handle them, everybody would raise their hand. So it comes down to people understanding how to do it the right way. And, and so, again, opening cold call, you're typically, it's a quick, fast-paced handling of a reactionary response. Later on in the deal, uh, you're, you're, you're basically probably going to be presented with uh, one or two false, fake, made up uh, uh, objections before you can really get down to, to what the real problem is. So it's almost like, and you may or may not kind of get relate or, or have come across this before. We had a pickup artist on the show recently and he was talking about um, women. And obviously this goes beyond men and women. It's like masculine and feminine, but feminine or women giving masculine or men shit tests. And they want you to succeed. They want you to get past that test, but they give you essentially a fake objection, a reason why they don't want to speak to you at the bar, a reason why they don't want to do whatever you're suggesting, because they want to see that you're a leader. They want to see that you can prove you that you've got past this, that you can you can handle it, and that there's someone that they should trust and follow. How much of it is kind of inept and a thought about like that from the person who is. Uh, that's on the other end of the phone and how much of it is literally they don't have time they're not interested they don't want to do it how much of it is strategic from them and how much of it is just words that are coming out of their mouth that they're not even processing if that makes sense i, I mean i don't know what the scientific breakdown of it is and and i don't know if there was a way to find that if you called me and tried to sell me something uh right now at the office uh i'd say hey man not interested don't have the time and i'd hang up okay now if you called the office and said, Hey, I've got a way to sell a thousand tickets to your 10 X growth con in 2018. I'd be like, man, I got all the time in the day. For you. <laughs> right. Because that's a, that's, that's something I have my attention on right now is, Hey, how do I sell 8,000 tickets to this event? So there's not one person on the planet who cannot make the time for something. If it's important enough, if it's something they have attention on, if it's something that they have, like they, they have this, a gushing wound and and they need a band-aid for it ASAP. There is like there, there's not one person who wouldn't make the time for that. I, I work with Grant Cardone, right? Worth a couple hundred million bucks. Uh he's he's chasing four or five ninety million dollar real estate deals right now, flying to different cities. I get him for for 15 seconds on a phone call. Hey, how's everything going? Good. Yeah, okay, but bye. Right. The second I start talking about something that actually has interest on him, hey, how are we going to sell more of these tickets? Hey, I got an idea about this. He got all the time in the world. So again, on, on an opening cold call, large percentage of what you hear are not true real objections. And um, later on in the process, as you start really working into the deal, hopefully if you've done your job asking questions and presenting the product, um, then and doing all the right things up front, then you're going to know a lot of the objections that they're going to have uh, to moving forward. Love it. Okay, so you, when you were describing the analogy of, of sniper and corners and shooting, as you uh, were describing a cold call, your face lit up and you had a big smile on there. So clearly, you would be one of the three that would raise their hand in the hundred that loves cold calling. Clearly, there's opportunity to make a shitload of money from it, and you're clearly, uh, I can only assume that you're doing really well from that, and so that adds to it over time, of course. But for someone listening to this show now who has been avoiding cold calling or someone who sucks at it, they now have the context of objections, whether they're real, whether they're fake, that someone, at least one person out of the, the billions of people out there from this conversation, they know at least one person likes it. So that proves that you can like it too. How do they get it in their head that this is a positive thing that they should be looking forward to as opposed to something that they're nervous about? Because clearly if you're nervous when you go into it, you're not going to have the best results. I'll just tell you right now, I hate making cold calls. Like, if you ask me, like, do you love making cold calls? Like, who in this group loves making cold calls? I would not raise my hand. 
I don't love being a salesperson. Like I, I, I'm not in love with being a salesperson. Okay. But I want to make money. Like I, my, my, my desire to make money and succeed and win in life is greater than my dislike for making a cold call or being a salesperson. So I want to be successful. I, I didn't go to law school. I didn't go to medical school. I'm not tall enough to be an athlete. I'm not good enough at golf to be a professional and get paid for it. It's just not real for me. But I'm not willing to give up on my first goal, which is, dude, I want to freaking win in life. I want to be financially free by the time I'm 40 and do whatever the hell I want to do. So I'm willing to do all the things that I don't want to do in order to get there. And 95% of people are not willing to make the, that, that decision. So, so like, how do you get sold on cold calling when you freaking hate it? You get a goal so big that you'll do anything to get it. You got to clarify what's important to you and you got to burn that into your head so that the only thing that you're thinking about when you show up and you pick up that phone is every time I pick up this phone and make this call, I'm getting one step closer to that thing that I want. I'm getting one step closer to, to the, the life that I want to live. I'm getting one step closer to, you know, a million dollars a month in passive income for the rest of my life. Like you, you have to view, you have to change the game. So I don't think you have to love it. And I don't think you have to love being a salesperson. And I think that, that people flip that conversation They're, they're you know, they, they think they need to love being a salesperson. You don't, you'd need to be great at it. You know, you need to be great at it so that you can win and you can make money and you can be successful. Like, that's why I'm a salesperson. It ain't because I love it. <laughs> we've covered this on the show. I'm glad you said this because we've got the same thoughts on this. We've covered it on the show before. I think sales is because it's difficult, because it can be stressful, because it can be a burden on your know, time and resources and, and other things. I think sales should be a, a 5, 10, 15 year stint as opposed to a career. And it's why I have problems sometimes when people talk about selling as a as a profession that you start at university and you do it for, you know, the foreseeable future. If people start going to university, you know, uh, you know, true academic uh, university for four, four or five years to do this, I think it's just going to become commoditized. And then there'll still be, you know, to use your language, like the killers who will be crushing it and earning 10 times more than anyone else from that perspective. And I think that's where we should all be, be aiming for. And I think we should be working to achieve that financial freedom. And so with all that said, give us a bit of, because I've talked about why I've started the podcast, why I left my sales role to, to achieve financial freedom in a condensed amount of time versus the, the traditional way of going about it. But Jared, tell us now you've said this, when did you have, I'm assuming it was a light bulb moment of you don't want to just have a job for the rest of your life. You want to condense down this time that you're going to spend working. And then maybe you'll work after the fact, but you don't have to, you've got control of things. When was that light bulb moment and, and, and how did it come about? You know, for people who haven't heard my story before, uh, 21 years old, I was selling advertising for a billion dollar company. I was living at home with my parents still. I was making 180 grand a year. I had zero ex debt, no, no expenses, no bills. And I literally, over the course of two years, blew every dollar I made uh, going out, drinking, partying, uh, started smoking weed, doing drugs. And then uh, three years later, I turn around, I'm on unemployment, I'm smoking weed every day, and I'm overweight, and I'm just like, dude, what happened to my life? Like, everybody was telling me, you're gonna be, you're gonna do so, so many amazing things, everything's gonna be great for you, you're gonna be so successful. And then I look back, and I'm at a point where I'm like, I am like lower than low right now. And so I ended up moving away from my fam my friends uh, with my dad to go work for him in a different state, moved from California to Texas. And I kind of was starting to get everything put back together there, like just focusing on being productive. I had a job again, like, you know, just working through that. And so like I had to go from this low point and kind of start working my way back up to just like even like a basic normal stage. And then once I got to that, I was like, you know, I was reminded of, hey, you have potential. People think you, you know, they see something in you. Um, and then my dad, I actually moved back to San Diego away from my parents. And my dad sent me a video on YouTube of a, of a guy named Grant Cardone. And I watched one video of it and then a second and then a third. And then four hours later, I'd gone through every video that he had on his YouTube channel. And I was like, dude, I got to go work for this guy. Like, because what he did is he... He showed me, he's like, dude, this is real for you. Like you have the opportunity to do this. It's not, it's not past you. You didn't miss your opportunity. You didn't miss your window. 
Like you could, you have control over this. All you have to do is make the decision. And so I made the decision. I moved up to LA, worked with him, was lived on a, slept on an air mattress for a year, was broke, figuring out this sales thing, this cold calling thing. And, and uh, I, I worked for him, almost quit, worked for him for maybe a, a year and a half, almost two years. And I started making money, seeing him with all his money. I'm like, man, this, there's something happening here. And about a year and a half or two years later, I had a hundred grand in the bank. So I had a hundred grand cash in the bank and I looked at myself and, and, and I was like, okay, this is a moment here. Like you've reached a pretty significant amount of money compared to most people at your age uh, in the bank. What are you going to do with it? And I was like, I got to go big. I got to get, I got to, I got to go all in and I have to start multiplying my money. So the money that I made wasn't mine. The money that I will continue to make isn't mine. It's all an investment in the future. So I just started banking everything. So that was like probably 27 years old that that, 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 that whole deal went down. And four years later, I was a millionaire. Where should the audience go with everything that we just thrown at them? Because we've covered a lot of ground here. If they were to take one thing from this episode, if you could drill one thing into their head and clearly people are driving at the, 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 the gym and you've just motivated them in this moment of motivation, what's the one thing from whether they should be role-playing, whether they should be you know using Cardone University, whether they should be embracing cold calling rather than running away from it, something I've probably not kind of uncovered myself through this the, the kind of three or four points there. What's the one thing that it should take away from this conversation, Jared? Look, if people are coming here because they want to improve their ability to handle objections, it's only going to happen through role playing, right? Agree, acknowledge, redirect. Like it's a very simple process of actually handling an objection. But most people decide to have confrontation rather than agreement. So they can't even get into the, 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 the objection handling sequence, right? And, and, and none of that matters if you don't role play. So, you know... I completely understand you're not interested. 90% of the people I talk to aren't interested either. Uh, down the street, I just spoke with so-and-so and you know, we did a deal with them two months ago. Their business is up 45%. I just wanted an opportunity to share the same, the same product with them, uh, with, you, with you from them or whatever your specific situation is. People tell us they're not interested and they don't have time all the time. Is that something we should be doing? I think you've touched on something really important here. Should we be documenting the objections that we get so that we can suss out what ones we can knock out and role play on. Because that's something that I never did when I was in the medical device sales role. And it's something that in hindsight, there's probably only three objections that I ever got. And sitting down with someone smarter than myself or a salesperson who's really crushing it in the team and asking their opinions, that probably would have solved those three objections for me. Is that something that we should be doing? Should we be documenting this? 100%. Like you, you got to know, like if I walked back into my sales office right now and I said, Hey, what are the top three sa- objections that you hear on a call? They're going to be like, not interested. Don't have the time. It's too much money. And that's all we, that's what we drill and role play. Occasionally there's another third or, or fourth or fifth one that comes in. And so we'll drop that into the training sequence. But, but most of the time it's handling those three issues. Not interested. Don't have the time. It's too much money. <laughs> well, when you, it's funny. Cause when you say it like that, it's making me laugh and smile as I say this. It's so simple, right? It's it's like a it's a simple problem that obviously takes skill to solve. But are we blowing all of this out of proportion when people are scared of cold calling? When people are scared of maybe it's not even the objection they're scared of. But are people scared of the confrontation? Is that the problem? It, it could be. It could be that they're scared to, to to stick in there, but they're only scared because they don't know. You only fear things that are unknown to you. And so the, the more knowledge you build and gain and the, the, the higher your comfort level will go. Do you, do you, do you watch baseball at all? I uh, No, I've, I've got family in Chicago. I watched one game, had no idea what the hell was going on for hours on end. I was just scared of the ball hitting me in the face the whole time. So, uh, <laughs> but you but use a baseball analogy because some of the audience will probably understand it. So like at the end of the game, you know, uh, they have a pitcher who's like the closer, right? He comes in, he usually pitches, uh, the last inning of the game or last inning and a half of the game. Um, and he's like, you know, he comes in with a fresh arm. He throws, you know, a really high mile per hour fastball, 97, 98, 99 mile an hour fastball. And most of the time these guys just get in there and they throw the ball really, really hard. Right. Most batters know when they go up against the closer, that he is throwing a fastball. 
they know what pitch is coming and they still miss. So a professional who knows what pitch is coming still misses sometimes. So uh, uh, an, uh, an amateur who doesn't know what pitch is coming and who hasn't trained on hitting that pitch, what chance do they have of hitting the ball? Almost none. So like you have to understand that you, you don't make contact every time. If I picked up a, if I picked up a phone and made a hundred cold calls today, I would lose on calls. It's just part of the deal. Like even the best prepared, even the most professional, even the one who can predict the objection, who knows the call is still going to get hung up on. Right. And that all goes back to like, how do you take that, that experience? Is it a loss for you? Cause if it's a loss for you, then you're going to have all those emotions associated with it. If you can handle an objection the right way, or you can view that the situation you were in, the objection that you received as an opportunity to move closer towards your goals and closer towards that early retirement, closer towards that new car or that raise or that house or those shoes or whatever, the suit, whatever's important to you. If you can view every opportunity as something that moves you closer rather than further away and is a win instead of a loss, then a lot of the lack of confidence and the fear and the uncomfortability and the, the lack of confidence, whatever you want to call it, that is associated with handling objections, cold calling, closing, whatever, uh, then a lot of that stuff goes away. Amazing stuff. Makes perfect sense. And Jared, I've got one final question, mate, and we'll wrap up with this. Something I ask everyone that comes on the show, and that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, I don't know whether it would be your 21-year-old self or beyond, beyond that, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? I would have learned how to cold call back then. I mean, the cold call is, is the, is the liberating thing. It, 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 you, you know, it's the one thing that can give you the, the, the pathway to do whatever you want. So I go back to 21. I actually, the example I use, the advertising example, that was me. I had a set territory. I went in and I built relationships with people and they bought more based on how much they liked me. It had nothing to do with me going in and getting cold opportunities and new business and creating something. It was because I was personable and they liked me and I took them to baseball games, you know? Um, so, so I would go back and I would say, look, uh, it, master the cold call. If you hate the cold call, it's even more important that you do it because you said, Hey, you know, sales should be a four, 10, 15 year stint. And then you should go on and do something else. If you want to go start your own business, you're going to become a salesperson again. And you're going to need to pick up a phone call. And you want to be prepared for that call. Love it. Well, with that, Jared, tell, tell us where we can find out more about you kind of personally. And then Cardone University and everything else that goes along with that as well. Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook. It's at Jared Glant, J-A-R-R-O-D-G-L-A-N-D-T. Um, you, can, you can sign up for our programs. You can get free access. Uh, to our university free trial access at cardoneuniversity.com. Just hit get free access and uh, you'll get uh, a log into the program and you can see what some of the content's about. Uh, we have a huge event coming up in February of 2018 called the 10X Growth Conference. Three-day event. Day one is going to be all uh, CEOs, business owners, guys that are all doing over $100 million a year in sales that started from nothing. They're going to teach you how to scale and grow and lead and, and have vision for your, the position that you're in. Day two is all about marketing, branding, uh, you know, uh, lead generation, expanding your footprint in the marketplace and creating sales opportunities. And day three is about how to create a successful environment, how to be healthy, fit, uh, you know, how to get the right mindset in yourself and your team. So it's a really comprehensive three-day event. People can get more information about that at 10xgrowthcon.com, 10xgrowthcon.com. We're going to have the most badass lineup of speakers that you see at any event this year, I guarantee it. Well, I will link to all of that in the show notes to this episode over at salesmanpodcast.com. And with that, Jared, we covered a lot of ground here, mate. So I appreciate that. And I'll thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. All right, take care. 